Oh, praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome back to another Sunday morning virtual service. We are here again, and man, people of the way, I just love you so much. Thank you so much for being with us, for worshiping with us, uh, for having this time of community together. Let me tell you, if you are not in the chats, you need to get in the chat. If you're on YouTube, let me. the YouTube chat is fire. Y'all need to look at what... The, the people in the YouTube community are really, are it's a fun time. And also the Facebook people, I see you out there, the Facebook people who are watching, your comments are so amazing. Why don't you just throw a shout out, uh, just say praise the Lord to someone. Why don't you just let people know that you're watching. And I see y'all, y'all who don't comment, I know you there. How you doing? Happy Sunday. It's good to see you. All right, well, let's get into our word. I'm really excited about the word that God has for us as a community today. Uh, I just want to open in prayer, and then we're going to dive right in. Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready to hear the word? I wish I had some people here with me, but, you know, it's coming. We getting there. We getting there. All right, so let's just open with a word of prayer. So, God, God in heaven, God of the universe, God, we love you. We come to you today recognizing your greatness. God, you are holy. There's nobody else like you. And we thank you for this time. Thank you that we're able uh, to fellowship together in this way. Lord, we pray that you would open your word into our hearts and into your into our minds. God, that you would give us a new revelation, that you will show us the things that you have for us today. God, we thank you for those. I just feel a need to pray for those who might need healing today. If you are in a need of a healing, God, I just pray that you would bless that person who needs a healing in their minds, their bodies, their emotions. God, we believe on their behalf that they will be healed in Jesus' name. Lord, just have your way today. We thank you and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen and thank God. All right, saints. We're going to hop right in. Before we get into the word, I just have a, a quick question just to kind of frame our time together. Um, have you ever experienced or had a bad experience of staying at someone's home and you didn't really feel welcomed? Have you ever had that experience? Someone invited you to stay with them. You came. But you were just uncomfortable. It just it just didn't work out. Like I had a, a time where I was having an extended stay somewhere, and I someone invited me over, and it was great. It's like great, I'll just come and and be there. But it was just uncomfortable. Like in my mind, I was like, okay, I won't eat out this whole time. I'll be able to cook, and you know, while I'm staying there. But there was like no room in the fridge. There was like dishes in the sink. There's no counter space. Uh, when I wanted to watch TV, like people are all in the living room, sprawled out, watching whatever. And the bathrooms were always taken. Are you one of these people I had to take my shoes off and walk around the house? I don't know. No shade to y'all who do that. Um, but I just wasn't comfortable. Have you ever had an experience like that? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the quality of your host the, it, it enhances your experience, right? Because conversely, have you ever had a time where you stayed at someone's house and they said, hey, make yourself at home, and they meant it, like you really felt welcome. Like it was now your second home. I, I stayed with a family member's house, and their bed was so, I was like, this is your guest bed? Like it's amazing. Can I take it home? Can I put it on my car? Can I take it on a plane with me? Like I felt so at home. You just had run of the house. Here's the fridge. Here's food. Here's the Wi-Fi password. Like it's just a beautiful thing to feel at home. Have you ever had that feeling before where you didn't want to leave? <laughs> like can I just stay here please? All right. Well today, today, saints of God, I want to talk about hosting the presence of God. That's the title of our message, hosting the presence of God. And I want us to see how being a good host relates to our spiritual lives, right? Let's let's just dive right into it. Last week, 
if you were watching or you could go back and watch, uh, we talked about the having a, the experiencing a personal Pentecost. Y'all remember that? A personal Pentecost. And why we celebrated the day of Pentecost. Why it was so momentous because it was the day where the Holy Spirit fell on the, on the church. And it was so significant because for the first time in history, people had access to God. Like, it's mind-blowing. It was the first time ever that God did not just send Holy Spirit to rest on someone, but instead the Holy Spirit dwells inside of a person. Can I say amen? Do you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you? Because we have access now. Because you have to understand, in the Old Testament, I know I say this a lot. I, I love to, to just bring this up because it's so significant. You have to understand, in the Old Testament, the presence of God was not accessible. It was not. There was levels to this. There was like laws and routines and ceremonies and washings and cleansing. And there was blood involved. It was a lot to get into the presence of God. And when I say the presence of God, I'm talking about that time, that thing, that feeling when God manifests as God's self and you can feel God tangibly. I don't know, this is what happens when we're in worship, when Minister Lauren sings, when all these things happen, when we hear a word going forth and we just can feel the presence of God. Yeah, that wasn't happening in the Old Testament. You had to go through levels. God's presence only resided among the people in a symbol, and it was called the Ark of the Covenant. It's the Ark of the Covenant. And this is something that God commanded Moses to build. It was an Ark of the Covenant. It was a chest made of wood, and it was covered with gold. And it, it was very symbolic because they kind of the wood symbolized humanity. The gold represents the divinity, which will eventually point us to Jesus, right? And on top of this box, there was a thing called the mercy seat. It was the lid. And that was made of 100% pure gold, which represents the, the nature of God, the divinity of God. And uh, this was a very special ark because in this ark, lived the Ten Commandments. Remember when Moses came back down, I guess the second set, because he broke the first set. Um, there was a gold pot of manna. So it was like memorabilia, like from the times gone by. It was a gold pot of manna, and there was Aaron's rod. It was Aaron's rod that budded as a sign. Those three things were in this ark. And this was very special because on top of the lid, there were cherubim. They were angels. And that would represent the presence of God. And in between the, cher the cherubim is where the presence of God will reside. And it was so special. This is where God was like, look, I know it's, I'm, I'm trying to dwell among sinful men. And this is going to be a, a, a representation of me being with you. My presence will be with you in this ark. And this ark lived in a place called the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. When they, when the tabernacle was portable and they went through out the wilderness and eventually it went into the temple. But it was in the Holies of Holies. And if you remember, you can only access the Holy of Holies one time of year on the Day of Atonement when the priests would go in and make atonement for all the people's sins. One time, one once a year, and he had to do it right because he didn't follow all the rules, he would drop dead because the presence of God was not to be played with, all right? So this is just a, ba a back story about the ark of the come, how this was just, this was the only way to access God. And the presence of God, it, this was, this ark was a centerpiece of worship for God in, 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 in Israel. It represented the presence of God, that God was with them, and kings and priests would go there, and they would ask God things and ask for direction and ask for clarity. It could only be found in this representation called the Ark of the Covenant. And God wasn't playing. You had to follow exact rules to be able to access that, right? So this was all set up 
for what our passage, our passage today. Our passage today is coming from 2 Samuel 6. We're deviating a little bit from the lectionary, um, but we're going to 2 Samuel 6. And this is such a great story. I'll give you a little bit of the backstory before we get to 2 Samuel 6. Um, before this time, David is now king, but in times past, when Saul was king, the Ark of the Covenant had been neglected. It was neglected. It was left. It was often stolen by the Philistines. And you really, you really got to read, <laughs> you got to read these stories because every time someone tried to steal the Ark of the Covenant, it would just go all bad for them. Like it would be all kind of disease would break out, plagues, the, 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 you know, their, their idols would be chopped up. All kind of crazy things would happen. It never worked out. They would send the ark back like, here, please take, take the ark. We don't want it no more. Just, we're sorry. All right. So the ark had been neglected after Saul and David had an idea. He's like, you know what? I want the ark back. It belongs in Jerusalem. We getting it back. We restore and worship. We going to do everything. Let's go. Let's get it back. So in, when you open in 2 Samuel 6, David is formed this whole coalition to get the ark back. And it, it, it's like a thing. It's like a parade. It's a processional. There's music. There's dance. You got to read it. It's all in here. They made a new cart, a new cart to put the ark of the covenant in. And the cart would be driven by oxen. And it was a thing. And they were going to... Um, break out into dance routines like a flash mob and the whole thing to bring the ark back. It was, it was amazing. I wish we had videotapes of this. But I'm going to pick up in 2 Samuel 6, and I'm looking at verse 6. is after they described all of the instruments that was there. And it says, And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacom, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God, and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his era, and he died there beside the ark of God. Oh my goodness. Verse 8, and David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. I love this. Verse 11, and the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Can I get an amen? This is such a, a, a story, like this is such an odd story, but it really, it really goes into what we're talking about today. David did all the things. He planned a big celebration, but as the, the cart was coming in, the cart slipped, and our brother Uzzah thought he would help God out, and catch the card. You know, this is a lesson. This is a side sermon. God don't need no help. God, can I get it? Amen. God don't need no help. Then Brother Uzzah had to learn the hard way. What was the problem here? It seems a little harsh. Like, dang, you just going to strike him down right now? That's what David felt like. David was like, man, you just going to kill my man, God? Like, really? But you have to remember that God is not a cruel God, but God does things in order. And God specifically laid out in the law how the ark was to be transported. Now, the heathens, when they were done being punished by God, was send the ark back in the cart. But it wasn't for the people of God to do the same thing that the other people were doing. God laid out specific rules, and the rule was that the ark was to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. It wasn't to be put on a cart made by man. God doesn't need man-made things to carry God's presence about. God's presence wants to be shouldered on, this, on, on the backs and on the shoulders of people, of, the, of his priests, of the, of the people who he sent out to minister. We are to carry the presence of God, not to manufacture 
That's another sermon. But there was a specific things that they were supposed to, to do, and Uzzah thought he would help God out. And God was like, yeah, we're not doing that here. And David got mad. And what did he do? He dumped the ark at our man Obed-Edom's house. My boy, oh, he left the ark at Obed-Edom's house. And I love this because typically the ark had a history of destruction. Those who mishandled it, it, it just didn't work out for him. But then you have this man, Obed-Edom, who was like, you know what? I'll take it. It's good. It could come to me. So what killed others, he gladly welcomed. You know, things are only dangerous to those who don't know how to work it. Amen? Let's take fire. You know, a grill master knows how to harness fire. But a person who doesn't know how to handle fire will start a wildfire, right? Electricity. It could be harnessed for our good. But if in the wrong hands, it could cause lots of harms. Look at knives. Uh, you put that in, a, in the hands of a master chef. You could whip up all kind of things. But in, a, in the hands of a toddler, it won't work out. It depends on who's holding it. Obed-Edom was like, I will take it. I will take the Ark of the Covenant. I, it will stay. It can stay with me. It's no problem. And I'm wondering how. How did Obed Edom come to this conclusion? Why was he so comfortable? You just saw what the Ark just did. Why were you so comfortable with the presence of God? And and because of it, his whole household was blessed. What was it about Obed Edom that pleased God? Well, I believe it was because. He was a good host. He was a good host. If you go uh, do further reading, uh, it goes to describe Obed-Edom in 1 Chronicles 15. And it says that Obed was a Levite. And Levites were responsible for, for uh, caring for the tabernacle and for worship. Everything in the tabernacle they were to take care of, and they were responsible for worship. So like us... Obed-Edom had to work from home. Are y'all with me? Obed-Edom would usually work in the temple. But now the temple came to his house. And so he had to work from home. He didn't get to go to the... Every, everybody went to the temple because of this thing, the Ark of the, of the Covenant, the presence of God. And now that Ark was sitting in his living room. He's just like us. We thought we were going to work and just do life and just do church a whole nother way. But what happens when the church comes home? I believe that Obed-Edom created a sacred space for God in his home. I could just imagine how he made it holy, how he reverences the kids that come running through. Ah, uh -uh, you can't run through here. Nope. Mm -mm. Presence of God is here. No, 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 don't put that drink down. Nope. And if he was a Levite, get me, he was a worshiper. It also says in, the, in, in 1 Chronicles when they're listing all the Levites that he was a musician. So I could just imagine Obed Eden before, you know, maybe before the kids got up, he would just take some time and worship before God, worship before the ark. I have an opportunity to house the one thing that signifies the presence of God. Oh, I'm going to worship before it. I'm going to follow all the rules. I'm going to make sure that it's honored. I'm going to make sure it's, 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 it's reverenced. And it says that God blessed everything in his house because of it. Everything else, you know, everybody's not meant to house the things of God. And when God gives you an opportunity like Obed-Edom, what would you do? I love this because it says that David heard about this. Look at uh, 2 Samuel 6 and verse 12. And it was told to King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all, somebody say all, all that belongs to him because the ark of God. So, so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. 
And, you know, he, after if you keep reading, he learned how to do it right. This time he brought the priest. He did it correctly. He had sacrifices going. He was like, oh, okay, I get it. Who in your life are you provoking to, like, a holy jealousy? Look like David was, like, holy godly jealous. Like, oh, uh-uh. So you telling me he, he, the ark is in his house and is working and he's being blessed? Oh, no, 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 no. I need that in my life. I want to experience the presence of God like that in my life. I want to know God like that in my life. Who are you spiritually provoking? Hmm. You guys really go back and read this whole story. It's so good. So now I want to fast forward to Pentecost. You're like, what does this have to do with the personal Pentecost? This is like a part two from what we talked about last time. Fast forward to Pentecost. Okay, remember, God now no longer dwells in tabernacles, in temples, or in arcs, or in churches. Instead, for the first time in history, God lives in human beings. God dwells in human beings. Um, I have scripture to back that up. Do you remember uh, 1 Corinthians 6? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with the price. So glorify God in your body. Amen. You you, my brother, my sister, you now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So now that the Holy Spirit dwells within you, how will you host the presence of God? What type of host are you? Are you a good host where God could come in and make God self at home and, you know, just have the lay of the land and, you know, oh, go do it. Have, you have free run of the house, God. Yeah, you have free run of, you could go, you could do it, or is God restricted from certain rooms in your house? Like, God, you could, don't go in the closet. Like, don't open that bathroom door. Don't look under the rug. Don't, please don't go look under the bed. Don't go in the garage, Lord, because it's too much stuff. I don't want you. How is your, what kind of host are you? And I just want to really take a time, and I really want you to zero in on me. Really listen to me. Because I think God is really speaking to us in this. We are living in a very unique time. We are living in a unique time. And I believe we have been extended an invitation from God. We have been extended an invitation by God to know God in such a more deeper, intimate way. Listen, without assistance, of a worship leader, without the assistance of a crowd, without the assistance of a prayer line, without necessarily human interaction, God is inviting us into a very unique time when we are able to host the presence of God for ourselves. Now, community gatherings, yes, and corporate worship is so important. I'm not discounting that. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like when we're all here together. There's nothing like hearing everybody singing and praising and touching your neighbor and uh, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. There's just nothing like that. There's nothing like that. But, 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 but don't miss the lesson of the season. I really think that God is inviting us into a, a, an important lesson in this time. And I just want to reiterate that you know Sunday worship services when we're all together? You know, those should just be an overflow of what's going on between you and God at home. Amen? I'm going to say that again. That should just be residual. That should just be the overflow. And when you come 
to church, it should just be a natural overflow of what you're already experienced at home. Like, I don't need anybody to be a hype person for me, for God. I don't need anyone to beg me to worship God. I don't need to follow, do follow the leader. Like, everybody raise your hands. Everybody clap your hands. Everybody, like, I don't need anyone to tell me what to do because I brought my own praise with me. I've been, I've been nurturing this praise. I've been having my own time with God. I've been experiencing everything thing that we're doing in here I've already experienced for myself at home by myself because I've learned to host the presence of God and you know when we all come together it's not I'm not just going to sit back with this consumeristic attitude and I'm just going to wait for the preacher to give me a word like I need somebody you you better say something to me I need help I need you to to give me something you know we almost turn into like um for lack of a better word, like we need a hit. Like we just need like, like this is the place where we get spiritually high and we just need a hit to last us throughout the week. I just need one hit, but I don't think that's the the way God meant it. I believe that we're supposed to not wait on someone to give us a word, but we should give the word of God for ourselves. And when we come to church, it's just a confirmation of what God is already saying and doing in our hearts. Amen. So while we're in this in-between time, we're in this in-between time, things are starting to open up. We are really praying and discerning with our leaders, like, when would be the best time to open up? Because because we love you, it would devastate us if anyone got sick or, you know, God forbid, if anyone died because they came here and co- contracted COVID. God forbid. So we love you. We are really taking our time with this process. But let me tell you, in between, in this in-between time, I believe that God is inviting us to learn to host the presence of God for ourselves. So let's use June. June is coming up. Y'all know that June is our second consecration. It is our Daniel fast. I, I hope I heard cheers in the, in the spiritual land. I, yes, we're doing our consecration and our Daniel fast. And this is our month where we can really tap in and experiencing God in a way. You know, when we fast, we're fasting, you know, not just to lose weight or to be healthy. We are fasting and consecrating because we want to see a move of God. We want to see God move. We want to see God manifest. What if we used our consecration to really use this time to get to know God in a more intimate way and host the presence of God for ourselves, Let's be really intentional this month. Are y'all with me? Y'all going to be with me? In the month of June, we're going to be super intentional. Like Obed-Edom, it's up to us to learn to create a space for God, for us to learn how to host God's presence. And I have just four, four ways that we could do this, four ways. The first way is just set aside time for God. Set aside time for God. It's whatever works between you and God, not morning, evening. That's, that's for you to figure out. But there just needs to be a time where God knows that God can find you. God can count on finding you in this time, in this place. Set aside time. This is a holy time. Do you know what holy means? Holy means to be set apart. Like, this is not when, um, when I'm just doing, like, Sometimes in my relationship with God, I just have touch points, right? I'm going to pray as I go, pray in the car, pray as, as I walk, pray as I'm going up the stairs. Like we're, we are to pray always. That is yes. But then there should be a time where you're, where you're able to be still and you're just able to sit and spend time with God. And you and God can work out how long that is, how much you need. That That's number one, set aside time. Number two. Set aside time for worship. I love this about Obed-Edom because if he was a Levite, I know he was taking time to worship God. Do you have a time with God where you can just put on a worship song or listen to Minister Lauren sing? And you're not just like, you know, listening to it, but you're engaging in the song. Like everything the song is saying, you're praying back to God. Everything that you're, like, you have time where you can lift your hands and really engage and really tell your heart to God. Really tell God how much you love and adore and appreciate God. 
Do you have time just to worship? That's number two. Number three, have a time where you can just pray. Set a time, time, set aside time to pray and hear back from God. Not just give a monologue, like spilling out everything, which is great, but also taking time to hear, to pray and hear back. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. This is what the presence of God feels like. When you're able, and it's such a beautiful time because you lose all sense of time. You lose all sense and nothing else matters. There's nothing else. There's nothing like it when you are able to have the presence of God for yourself, not just in a building, not just at church. And I also want to throw in there, have the time when you're reading the word of God and you're praying through the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God, I thank you for being my shepherd. I thank you that I will not want in you. Take a passage of scripture and take time to pray through it. And this is the fourth thing. Set aside a place where you can experience Holy Spirit. Now, this is just a time where you don't, you're able just to lift your hands. And you don't need a worship leader You don't need anyone coaching you, but you just have a still time where you could just experience what we talked about last week in Acts chapter 2. That the Holy Spirit will rest on you, dwell in you. You will experience the fire of God, the wind of fire, the wind of God blowing. You will even experience speaking in a heavenly tongue. Because you have this time, it's just between you and God. You develop a prayer language just between you and Holy Spirit. There's nothing like it to host the presence of God. Let's do this, right? The month of June, let's really practice. Let's really hone in what it looks like to do this at home. Because you know what happens when we all get together, when we're all finally able to be together? It's like we're all coming together like I'm a match, like I'm a, we're all matches, and I'm already on fire. So when I come in, I'm already lit. I'm already ready. And so when, it, when if I'm a lit match on fire and I'll join the other matches that are already on fire, then we just going to burn. We just going to get in here and have a good time in Jesus' name because I've already come with my own fire. Amen. I've already come uh, ready to receive. I'm already come to give. You don't have to pull from me. I'm ready to give. I'm ready to share. I'm ready to help someone, pray for someone. I don't just need everything to be about me all the time. And yes, sometimes we do need a jump. You know, when your your car, your battery dies, sometimes I come in, I need a jump. I need the saints, come on. I need to catch what you're doing. Sometimes I need a recharge. I need to plug in. Sometimes you do, but more often than not, our goal should be to come full. Already come full of the Holy Spirit. Already prayed up. Already worshiped up. Already ready to to just give God my all and to join in corporate worship when we're all together. See, there's a difference, and this is, I'm closing. There's a difference when we're on our Christian journey, when we're born again. We're born as babies in Christ. And we know when baby baby believers need to be fed, they need to be burped, they need to be changed, you need to do all the things for baby believers. But then there's a trajectory where we're moving to mature believers, where we're able to, to make our own meals. We're able to cook our own meals. We're able to eat for ourselves. Like I don't have to starve and wait for church to open. I don't have to wait for a preacher to tell me anything. I know God for myself. Me and God have been cooking up meals. And when I get together, I'm getting together to fellowship and to, you know, be in corporate worship. But I already know God. I'm already experiencing God because I've set aside time, dedicated time just to be and just to host God in this temple. Amen. So let's practice hosting the presence of God. Make room. Make more room for God in your life. And Holy Spirit will show up, I guarantee you, right where you are. Don't forget, you have a well of living water living inside of you that bubbles up. It never runs dry. All you have to do is tap into it. Let's just close in a word of prayer. God, I thank you. 
Thank you that you are the God of presence. You're not hiding from us, but you love to manifest yourself to your people, to your children. So God, I pray over our community, Lord, that we would use June as a time of consecration to personally host your presence. God, I pray for a grace over each person here who feels the tug of God in their heart that says, yes, this is what I want. I want to know God like this. God, will you give them a grace that every time they take time to, to spend with you, to pray with you, to worship, to read the word, that you would meet them in such an amazing way. And God, I just thank you for the day when we all get together, that we would already come full and charged up, that we would be ready to just corporately worship together. But we already know you for ourselves. God, bless our community. God, I pray for anyone who does not know you. If you are listening and you don't know the Lord, you want to know God like this, it's your opportunity to ask God into your life by just saying, Lord, I need you come into my life. I want to begin to follow you. God, I thank you that you're going to watch over us and keep us. God, I thank you for all that you're doing individually and personally and collectively. We love you. We give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you, family. We'll talk to you again next week. Have a blessed, blessed week. And don't forget to host the presence of God.